Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Money Matters podcast, the show where we discuss important financial topics that were never covered in med school. I'm your host, Dr. Tarang Patel. Welcome to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. In this episode, I talk with Dr. Eric Levi, an ENT surgeon who created a viral article earlier this summer when he wrote The Dark Side of Doctoring, an article relating to physician burnout and the lack of job satisfaction. Eric wrote this article based on his experience as a specialist uh, who is nearly completing the long process of specialty training in Australia, but I think his experiences are comparable with listeners in the U.S. and other Western nations. He has a series of articles that I encourage you to uh, read on his website. The question is not necessarily a financial topic. Um, if physician burnout leads to uh, increased job dissatisfaction and leaving the profession early, uh, obviously it'll have major financial consequences. Many physician colleagues are already talking about these issues more today than they were in previous generations. And I think what Eric wrote about and what we speak about on this episode will sound familiar, but he is hopeful that the system is now ready for change. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Eric Levi. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. My guest today is Dr. Eric Levi, an ENT surgeon from Australia, who recently wrote a great article called The Dark Side of Doctoring about the stresses and pressures faced by many physicians. This article has been shared throughout the social media universe and resonates with many physicians practicing in the developed world. Eric, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Darren. Thanks very much. Tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what uh, made you go into medicine in the first place. Um, it's an interesting story. I mean, I, I, I started thinking about uh, healthcare professions. I went into psychology as my first degree, and then I did medicine as my second degree. And then um, I became an ENT surgeon just because it's uh, one of those specialties that I really loved. I fell in love with, and it suited me. Um, my training has been in Australia, uh, in Melbourne in particular. Uh, and then I did a fellowship in uh, Canada, um, and now I'm back in Australia. Um, that's where my story is, briefly. You've been training quite a bit. I, I see you're, 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 are you going to be doing another fellowship? Is that right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm doing this crazy thing. I'm doing three fellowships in three different countries. So I've done a fellowship in Canada. I've done my second fellowship and just finished my second fellowship just now in in uh, in, in Brisbane, Australia. And I'm flying off in a couple of weeks to New Zealand um, to, to do a third fellowship. They're all in the area of pediatric uh, head and neck and ENT surgery. Um, you know, one of those things that I've, I've loved and I wanted to get more experience. That's great. When are you uh, when are you going to do your fellowship number 4 in the US? Uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I, I think I think my wife will kill me. I've tried to take in the family for a three year trip around the world. I think uh, we, we have I have to grow up. Uh, she said I need to grow up and get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. As as for many of my listeners, it's uh, you know, you're 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 currently in this long road training, but you're you're almost at the end of the tunnel. One more year to go, like you said. That's right. Uh, but let's yeah. let's let's talk about your article that yeah. uh, the dark side of, of of medicine or the dark side of doctoring I believe is the actual title. What what made you write it and what uh, um, you know, so there, yeah go yeah, ahead. Uh, yes yeah, so one of the one of the things was obviously um, some of your listeners may have may have read it or have seen pieces of it. Um, it was triggered by the suicide death of a of a colleague, uh, a senior gastroenterologist. And I think I was also in a place where I was experiencing a measure of burnout uh, emotionally and professionally. And I think that that death triggered my thoughts, uh, a lot of reflections, a lot of thinking, because more than anything, that, that suicide death was of somebody who's reasonably senior, who's got a great career, both in the public and the private sector in Australia, someone who's got, sounds like a great family, but no significant history of any uh, previous depression or suicide attempts. 
he was just a regular a doctor, a regular physician. And um, obviously, the sudden and unexpected death was uh, a surprise to many who knew him personally, the rest of us who have known him by, you know, by, by reputation. And it made me think, you know, uh, is this going to be something that I will experience in the future? Is this something that, that I need to think about right now in my career? Uh, and what's driven him to that point? And and all I did was one weekend, I just sat down and I started thinking about the things that, that pushed me into that area of despair or darkness or, or burnout, whatever terms you want to call it. And I came up with those personal, three personal things. And as you've alluded to, it's, it's somehow um, gotten a lot of traction from pretty much, you know, most of the uh, developed countries and many developing countries as well, um, who felt exactly the same way, you know, most clinicians and not just doctors, physicians or surgeons, but, but, you know, I've had emails from vets, dentists, nurses, physiotherapists or physical therapists, and pretty much anyone who works in healthcare, who, who experiences some or all of the things that I wrote on the blog. Yeah, I mean, it, it has been a, a tremendous uh, resonance. A lot of my colleagues have talked about it. And, you know, we said social media has accelerated it throughout the, um, throughout the majority of the, uh, the world and the developing world, as, as you said. So you talk about three specific things that put you in the pit of despair. I think these are, those are your words. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about them because I think those are the things that many physicians in the U.S., particularly the majority of my, where my listeners are, are from, can identify with that. So, so the first thing you mentioned is the loss of control. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, indeed. I mean, um, I've pretty much, the, the training system in Australia might be just a little bit different or a little bit longer compared to the U.S., uh, although we start a bit earlier. We finish off uh, high school and some of us go straight into medical school uh, rather than being a postgraduate degree. But either way, it's a long process. It's a long journey. And um, every single year, you've got to compete for a, a, a new training position. You've got to compete for more uh, publications. You've got to compete for jobs that are often hard to come by. And so, you know, people outside of medicine think that we doctors have you know, have control over our career. But during our training years, we actually have very little control. And even as a, as a, as a consultant, as a professor, as a fully qualified physician, as an attending, we are, our, you know, our control over day-to-day -day things and over our career is actually very res restricted and limited by a lot of forces beyond us, meaning administration, training programs, and, and, and universities and colleges and the, and the like. I mean, that's the big picture. Uh, we don't actually have as much controls as we would like to have with regards to our career. Interestingly as well, in the day-to-day -day basis, you and I know the moment we pick up that pager, we're almost a slave to that pager. When we're on call, you, surprises often happen or emergency calls occur. That means that we have to keep changing what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think experiencing that over so many years, over about 13 years of being a, being a doctor, being a physician right now, it's helped me, it made me realize that control is actually not something that I really have on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, I've got an operating list, I've got a clinic list, but what happens within that operating list or, or clinic list is out of my control a lot of times. I don't know what your system is like over there, but we get allocated operating list without too much of a, a discussion or clinic and, you know, patients get put into our clinic. You know, we don't even know sometimes how many we have on a, on a particular day. So small little things like that, I think over years have amounted to us feeling that we are almost quote unquote slaves to the medical industry. And I think that that has progressed over time. I mean, we think of physicians in the past, uh, you know, they were mostly independent practitioners. They were at least, uh, and again, I'm not sure how the Australian system was, but I assume it was similar. They were not employed by the hospital. They were practitioners yes. who operated at the hospital, who, you know, rounded yes. at the hospital. But they mm -hmm. could schedule their cases. And like you're saying now, it's becoming a situation where those things are dictated to you. And ultimately, you still are a physician. You want to do what's right for the patient. But that, that sense of control, like you're saying, slow, as it erodes slowly, does, does get to you over time. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, uh, indeed. And take, for example, a very simple thing such as what happens on the operating list. 
when it used to be that I, you know, I, I knew every single patient that I was going to operate on. And, you know, operation A in a particular patient might take 15 minutes, but the same operation in a different patient with a different condition and with different complex comorbidities might take longer. Now, but all of our operations have been averaged by a software system on the computer, uh, you know, uh, in the operating rooms, such that, you know, bookings and operating lists just got slotted in and we don't even have the control over saying, look, you know, this particular case will take a bit longer than the other cases that we've done. So can we just make more room and you know, the bookings department or the operating room department will probably say, no, you, you have to do this X number of procedures over this number of time or hours. So that, you know, things like that does change the way we practice medicine on a day-to-day basis. Absolutely. I think uh, some of that, like you mentioned, uh, as as medicine has become more of a business or industrialized, that that's happening here too. Now, I don't know I'm sure there are certain hospitals and and places in the U.S. where, you know, they aggregate that data. I'm not sure that it's um, quite to the level that you're describing, but I'm sure it's if it's not there yet, it's it's, you know, coming soon uh, because that is the direction that we're headed at as well. So the second thing you mentioned is the loss of support. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, on a day to day basis, uh, physically, we work on a typical day, maybe 12 hour long, uh, you know, starting our rounds at 6 or 7 a.m. Uh, and finishing our, our rounds in the afternoon uh, at 6 or 7 p.m. And then we get home and we still have to do a few more things in terms of studies and research and education and planning for lectures and things like that. Uh, and we have families and social support. Um, I mean, Physically, because of this sheer workload that we have, often time with our traditional social networks, family, friends, colleague, uh, colleagues uh, are cut down. When I trained, I trained um, in, in Melbourne and Victoria and every three to six months we had to move to a different hospital. That takes away, again, social networks. Every time we move, we got to set up in a new place, a new environment, and that gets really challenging. You know, although there are many sub- formal support systems available uh, in the hospitals, such as, you know, a phone line or a, a staff health clinic, often accessing those support systems are actually practically impossible for us because of the hours that we work in or the mobility of our career moving to a different hospital or a state or different state every few years or every few months. So that gets really challenging. So I think, uh, you know, what I was alluding to was the fact that it's almost hard to maintain traditional support systems once you enter the world of medicine. We've lost missed out on so many anniversaries and 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 reunions and social meetings and birthday parties because of our training and our work traditional social support is essentially uh, pulled away from under our feet uh, because of our careers right and and what do you think as far as you know uh, your colleagues and and pr- particularly your seniors many of them in the especially surgeons uh, notorious for this in the US 20, 30 years ago, especially, there was a, a famous uh, surgery residency program in the U.S. that claimed that they had a 100 percent divorce rate. And so mm. and if you didn't make it, you know, if you happened to make it through, they, it was it was an aberration, uh, you know, or it was mm. unlikely. But do you think that it's gotten better over time, at least with our colleagues, or do you think our colleagues are part of the uh, lack of support that we have? Yeah, it's a real it's a real interesting way of looking at it. I mean, we do have very similar challenges with our social, you know, and this is all anecdotal because from a point of view of numbers, it's very hard to actually get a, a good feel. But I, I remember, you know, going through the ENT program in our state, and there was there's usually about about nine or so uh, of people going through each year. And they always talk about there's always going to be a couple of divorces that's going to happen, you know, every year. Uh, it's a sad reality. Um, but, you know, both from a from a from an informal point of view, I think there has been a reduction in the informal support networks, just going out for meals together, drinking together and having kind of social time together with 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 colleagues. I think that has decreased 
the formal support, I think, in a way has gotten a little bit better in the sense that hospitals and colleges and professional colleges and academies and and state based health institutions are trying their best to provide some way, measure of formal support through, again, phone lines or, you know, um, uh, advice um, numbers to call or confidential meetings and support system like that or more formal things like seminars on 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 uh, mental health of physicians and and the like so there's both a, a more formalized support but at the same time i wonder how many are actually accessing those formal support systems or support services that are available one resident mentioned to me you know we can go to all, you know, we can go to all the, the free yoga classes that's given to us. Uh, it's still not going to change the fact that I'm exhausted after doing calls for so many hours or doing research paperwork and, and everything else. And, and there is some truth in that. Um, there's a challenge between providing good formal support versus also creating an informal culture of support within our uh, medical uh, group. And I, I think that is a very key point because I, I think for uh, many U.S. medical students, and I'm sure uh, the way you're describing it, it sounds similar and maybe even tougher in Australia, yeah. that you're so competitive during your medical school time to get good academic grades and, like you said, do research, that you're it's very competitive with each other. It's, it, it's sometimes hard for that same group of people then to turn around and become, you know, colleagues with, uh, with each other, particularly in the fields that are even, you know, more competitive to get into. So it's almost like a badge of honor to, you know, I work this hard and I work, you know, this many hours, you might be ostracized uh, for seeking help. But uh, yeah, so I, you're absolutely right. I think I think you've actually nailed a very good point there. Um, the, the the badge of honor uh, mentality in medicine is so strong and so pervasive. You know, every you walk into medical school and there's always a prize to go for. Um, you know, the so and so prize of clinical excellence or the so and so prize of of particular specialty of otolaryngology or something. And that I think has permeated through the fact that you know all through our medical school and our residency programs there is that 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 pervasive badge of honor perfectionistic culture that that is you know an undercurrent in our community which. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's it's great because obviously to a certain extent we have to do it for our patients we have to be the best surgeons and physicians and doctors we can be for our patients but at the same time as well that's also a, a two-edged sword in that it hurts us because we're not honest enough with ourselves to seek support from our fellow colleagues rather than competitors right absolutely that's that's very true now the the third thing that you mentioned uh, was loss of meaning. So so yes. what do you uh, talk about that? Yeah, um, again with the first two, the loss of uh, control and the loss of support. Those are systemic issues, slightly uh, bigger things that probably may have multiple different possible solutions. Now and that's um, and those are the, those two losses. Um, somehow I could handle a little bit better than this third loss that I felt, which is a loss of meaning. And it's hard for me to actually put it into words, whether it's meaning or morale or, or you know, a sense of vocational achievement. What I really meant was, you know, I we all signed up to to do medicine, to be a physician with an altruistic motive. Yes, there is a desire to do well financially and a desire to do well from a career point of view but you know beneath all that is our desire to actually do well for our patients it's a it's a service provision for the sake of our patients with the industrialization commercialization or the modernization of medicine and surgery i i feel that we have become just a commodity in a complex medical industry and we've lost that sacred calling or vocation or morale or meaning that drew us to medicine in the first place. And I think that's probably one of those things where I was from a position of burnout when I was writing that. And I realized, you know, what really burns me out is all the additional stuff that goes beyond just being a doctor to my patient. It was all the paperwork, all the competition, you know, all the, all the long hours and the exhaustion that I feel being dictated by 
other factors, administration and other, you know, other external factors. And that was a real challenge for me. And that may be something that you in the U.S. feel or, you know, many other physicians in other countries also feel is that they're no longer a physician, but they are a commodity. They are just one of those things in the complex factory line medicine where we're just one of the many encounters that a patient meet. And that's a real challenge. And I think that just erodes a little bit of the meaning of medicine for me. And that was something that I struggled with. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very insightful of you to you know, put these ideas to paper. And I think that you really have captured in, in a very eloquent way what, what many of us do feel. And, and you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Here in the U.S., my colleagues, you know, most of us who have finished training in the last five to ten years have, have transitioned from what used to be predominantly private or independent practices or, you know, or true academic centers to employed physicians, whether they're for an academic center or a true, just a private hospital. But the independent, the loss of independence has come at a price. And and some of my pre- previous guests have, have noted that, that 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 is something that that really you can't put price tag or a financial amount on, but it really does have a, a sense of loss. And I think what you describe is that you lose a sense of purpose almost. You you went to uh, become a physician, like you said, for the altruistic thing. Yes, you know, money is good, uh, achievement is good, but ultimately we want to help the patient. And what has happened is we have been reduced now to, like you said, commodities, procedure codes, you know, a tonsillectomy for you or, uh, you know, reading uh, 10 uh, CT scans for me in a given amount of time. And that, that, that really has... Um, I think taken its toll on on people, and and more and more physicians now are are looking to other uh, to get out, uh, either get out of medicine or to slow down, and you know which is good and bad, but it, it is a shame because none of us went into medicine um, for to to do that. We went in yeah. to help people, and and external factors, like you say, are 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 probably causing this. So. Let's yeah. let's let's follow up a little bit about that. You you talk about the industrialization yeah. of medicine yeah. and, and some of what I I read from your article and and some of the shared common um, issues that many of us face is in a word that you have said and and I know I've said it a number of times and many physicians on Twitter have posted this graph and I think you actually have too the the growth of administrators over time. So so talk about that. What do you what do you think that that has contributed to and I I, I you are very careful and I think you you put it in a very good way is that we're not anti administrator. We both need each other. Yes. But yes. But what yes. has happened uh, and and what do you think um that growth of administrators has done? Yeah. So I think it's a real it's a real challenge to think about this because we certainly need um, administrators, leaders, you know, clinical leaders or clinical administrators to help us do a better job as as doctors, as physicians. Uh, We know that we live in a world of industrialization where we would like every doctor, every physician to be playing their best. And we do need that. Um, but I think uh, the feeling that I've, uh, I have is that over many years, we started off employing administrators uh, and business minded people to help make the system work for us. But over time, it has almost taken over the whole system. And I wonder whether or not the application of business principles from the commercial world is truly applicable to the medical world. What I mean by that is what I feel when I'm working for a particular institution in Australia is that I am just one of those guys, employees down at the bottom, and the health administrators are in the middle and the top. And that seems to be a kind of a organizational hierarchy that that is present in a lot of hospitals. I kind of think of it the other way around, that we I work for my patient. I don't work for the health administrators. The health administrators work for the patient. They don't work for the physicians. It's almost we work together for the sake of our patients. And it's almost just a change of that hierarchical mindset that that, that I hope can happen. Sure, there are great health administrators around who are doing exactly just that. They become the support crew 
to ensure that their physicians and clinicians, nurses, doctors on the front line are playing the best game. Um, but I also see a lot of uh, institutions where it is a top-down hierarchy, where the CEO is at the top and the internal medical student is right down at the bottom. Um, I think a, minds, a mindset change or a, or a paradigm shift needs to happen to say that the health administrators are the support crew working together behind the scene, beside the clinician to make sure that service delivery or provision of care by the, by the clinicians are at their highest. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, one of the issues that, that we discuss here uh, often is, is we see so many administrators and, and like you said, you know, in, in their ideas initially were probably good, but they, certain administrators then beget more administrators. And then it just seems to, to grow. And, and so you have a series of people now telling you, you know, okay, you need this, you need to do this. You need to, you need yes. to have these discharge summaries done. And you already, yes. you already know this, but now you're getting constant, yes. uh, you know, multiple sides telling you the same thing. And none of that contributes anything to patient care. And that's the frustration that uh, many of us feel. Yes. One of the other things, this being a, a financial uh, podcast, is that, mm -hmm. you know, physician incomes uh, in the U.S. have generally been higher than the majority of the rest of the world. But Australia and Canada uh, also are, re are relatively high compared to, um, uh, you know, other Western countries. Uh, but th those salaries have basically been, when you account for inflation, flat to maybe minimally increased over time. Yes. And, and they don't yes. necessarily correspond with the the growth of uh, training times and the cost of uh, medical school, particularly, I'm not sure how it is in Australia, but the cost of medical school in the U.S. have uh, just exploded to, you know, yeah. some of the people yeah. are having, uh, you know, three to $400,000 in debt by the time they get out. But but anyway, uh, my, my point is, is that you, you see that the healthcare costs continue to rise astronomically in the U.S. And then you see administrators and hospital executives, like you were talking about at the top of the pyramid, yes. making routinely millions of dollars. Yes. And and so the frustration for many physicians are, you know, we're we're in, we're the ones providing the care. Our uh, other colleagues on the team, the nurses, the therapists, are all providing the care, and yes, yet they're not the ones. Yes, they're making a good living, but you know, yeah. it's just frustrating to to see the the support people like you like we described uh, profiting from the system to that right. degree when patients here specifically can't even afford care. So yeah, that that I right. think that also contributes to that loss of meaning that that uh, right. you, you talked right. about. Yeah. So yeah, very similar to to the Australian system as well. Our medical cost for me, sorry medical training, medical school, and residency training, registrar training, or specialist training are are, are extremely expensive, um, and our um, procedure codes or our salaries um, have not increased by much, or it does not match inflation rates. Uh, we have spoken about this, and in Australia we have mentioned this at all, but it's very hard for a group of doctors to lobby for an increase in salary because the society already thinks of us as already, you know, uh, achieving a, a higher income rate. So for us to actually say that we would like our income to match inflation rate, it's often a very challenging uh, a struggle. Uh, but yes, it is, it is ha definitely happening in Australia as well. Do, do you think that this is just inevitable, though, this progression of industrialization? Do you think there's anything physicians can do to change it? Or do we just, you know, learn to live with it and, and make changes uh, personally that, that will? I, I, certainly, I certainly hope that there, we have reached that, that the pendulum swing. You know, we have reached that point where we realize, OK, this is not working. Let's do something about this. Um, if we continue down this path, we're going to lose more doctors to suicide. We're going to lose more doctors to other careers. Uh, we're going to have a, a ballooning of costs and with no real 
good outcome or re, uh, improve outcome. I, I I consider it a couple of things. One is personal, and the other the other is is institutional. So on a personal level, I I, I read an, a, a very interesting study by uh, Dr. Tate Shanafelt, published a couple of years ago, and where, where where he studied a couple of thousand physicians, I think, from from the Mayo Group, and looked at productivity in relation or satisfaction in relation to the amount of meaningful work. And they found that if you did meaningful work for 20% of the time and 80% mundane work, you had high job satisfaction rate. And that's a ceiling, meaning if you did 50% of meaningful work and 50% of mundane work, you still you know, get the same amount of satisfaction. So it's almost as if the, the right balance is about 20 to 80, 20% true meaningful work, 80% sure paperwork, mundane administrative work. And you could get a pretty good job satisfaction and a good, in a sense, you know, uh, job efficiency. Um, and I, I saw that as a personal thing and I said, okay, great. What are the 20% meaningful work that I can do? So I could do a great job for my patients. And that 20% could be teaching, could be research, could be a particular study on a particular subject, anything. It could be leadership. Um, you know. So if I give myself 20% of my day to doing some of those things, I might have a much better productivity. And if every one of us had that opportunity to do that, I, I think it would improve our productivity as, a, as, as physicians and you know productively as institution as as an institution and you know for the bigger picture for the institution i mean that's something that they really need to think about a burnout doctor who's exhausted depressed and and not enjoying their work it's obviously a physician that's potentially going to make more errors you know, uh, lower productivity outputs. Uh, and so it's a real business sense for institutions to start thinking about improving the morale and the physicians so that they can be playing their best game. So they can actually be great doctors and that would elevate the productivity from a business sense point of view if that's what they want. That's very interesting because I think you know, and I'm not familiar with the article that you mentioned, but but that seems to be what our non-medical uh, colleagues, uh, particularly the companies in Silicon Valley, are doing in the U.S., such, such as Google, mm-hmm. Facebook. Yeah. I think they're giving their employees. I read somewhere where it's up to 20%, like you described, a, you know, time to dedicate to a project that may not be financially beneficial for the company, but may give them, you know, like you said, a little bit more meaning. And then ultimately that leads to more satisfaction with their whole yeah. whole job and hopefully a more productive, more valuable employee. So that 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 would be amazing if we could apply that to the medical world. It doesn't yeah. seem to be going in that direction, but I yeah. I really hope with, uh, you know, people like you and and the resonance that your articles have uh, ha- have had throughout the medical world, that we start having these conversations a little bit more. Let me let me ask you, um, as you know, I know you you've started this campaign, crazy socks for docs or something like that. Tell tell me about that. What what, what are you what are you what are you doing with that? Yeah, so so that's an interesting thing. Uh, I didn't quite start the campaign. It was a, a cardiologist from Melbourne by the name of Dr. Jeff Tugut. And he came up with that idea because he was struggling with his uh, mental health and he had some difficulties with his particular institution. And essentially, he came up with the idea of wearing some crazy socks to highlight uh, the prevalence of mental health issues in clinicians. I happen to just be a megaphone, microphone. I try to leverage that message message to bring it across to my uh, you know social media networks and and global network what it is is uh, the backstory was he came in to work wearing two different socks and somebody said are you okay what's wrong with you um, and that triggered the conversation of mental health in the workplace and I think the message was is very simple uh, doctors are humans doctors do suffer from mental health instead of um, having the stigma attached to a doctor with mental health, we should really be supporting each other and acknowledging that um, we need to provide better mental health support for our clinicians. Um, And also at the same time, we need to actually start thinking about mentally healthy workplaces. Now, it's all tied in together, again, with job satisfaction and job productivity. If we have mentally healthy workplaces, we will reduce the stigma of mental health in our profession. We will reduce the uh, troublesome burnout in our profession. We will reduce that 
kind of sense of loss of meaning and loss of purpose in our in our work. And, you know, the reverse of that is if uh, sorry, uh, and if we, we do provide that, that mentally healthy workplaces, we will increase productivity. I mean, we can apply the stuff that you've already mentioned earlier, what's happening with Google and, and other Silicon Valley uh, organizations to say if those employees can be maximized, why can't we as clinicians be maximized in our work as well? At the end of the day. There's a patient at the end of our stethoscope and there's a patient at the end of our scalpels. We have to be functioning at our best. And we, as an institution, as a community, need to provide that mentally healthy workplaces. And as you've mentioned, I think one of the key things about this has been that we are now talking about it. Probably a few years too late, but at least we're talking about it now. And the solutions in a country family practice would be very different to the solutions in a tertiary level cardiac transplant unit to get to all these issues that we've spoken about. Um, and I think the conversation has been good. Hopefully in the next few years, we will see a cultural change. We need a buy-in from the institutional leaders with regards to this topic as well. But at least I do get the feeling that there is a, um, a grassroots movement. The pendulum is swinging back to a more humane world of medicine for the practitioners within it. I think that's a very, very well put. Uh, that's what you know we're all looking for. We, we're all... Ultimately, as you said, human, even though sometimes we're asked to do superhuman uh, feats in terms of the, you know, the, the efforts that we put into our training. So I think that's that's great. Let me let me ask you one one last question. What what advice would you give to prospective medical students or medical students who are just starting out in their career as they listen to their more senior physicians, you know, who, who probably have a more jaded or a, a more negative outlook. What, what would you tell them to to kind of give them hope? I, I think uh, uh, what a lot of new medical students or, or, or prospective medical students feel is they're worried that they are entering into a world of cynicism in medicine where um, there is a, a turf war between clinicians and administrators. I would like to say that's not happening. Uh, that, that, that is not the, that is not the case. Um, at the end of the day, we went into medicine with the altruistic aim of doing well for our patients individually and society as a whole. And I think we, I, I can still say that right now, if I had my time all over again, I would still choose to be a physician, to be a clinician, to be an ENT surgeon, still the best job in the world to me. Um, the road is tough, but it is also one of the most re rewarding careers of, available. And I, and I also say that let's not worry about the really, really big picture. What happens on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is great. You know, you can always make a small difference. And a small difference in our world doesn't have to be expensive or extensive or anything like that. It can be just small little acts over time that changes our clinic and then it changes our operating rooms and then it changes our unit and then it changes our institution. So the bottom line is, it's a, it, you know, we are signing up for a tough profession with some challenges, but it is still a very worthwhile profession with a lot of very personal benefits uh, from being a from being a physician. Very well put. Well, th I want to thank you very much, uh, Eric, for participating in our uh, podcast and listeners to our podcast can follow Eric on Twitter at Dr. Eric Levi that are D-R-E-R-I-C-L-E-V-I or his blog at ericlevi.com. And I'll have links to your articles and to your Twitter uh, on our show notes. So let me ask you this. Uh, what, what do you have other than your impending move to New Zealand where – Probably you'll be a little bit more relaxed because it just seems like that's a very relaxing place to be. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. What, what do you have planned in the future for uh, as you you know after after training and and with your social media? Yeah. Uh, thanks. It, it is my pleasure to, to be here. Thank you so much for contacting me. It's been an enjoyable uh, conversation to me personally in discussion. Uh, look, I'm just going to enjoy New Zealand. Um, and in the future, um, I'll ultimately return to Melbourne and obviously I'll, I'll join a practice, set up a practice and join a, a, an institution back there. Uh, you've already alluded to something uh, which is the essence of the work that we do. I, I get 
the most joy out of just seeing patients on a day-to-day basis in clinic or 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 uh, in the operating room and I, and I enjoy that that's that's the best part of my job social media has been a, a very fascinating uh, experience for me I, I went in just wanting to learn from people and I have become engage with and th- uh, to a lot of people through through our discussion and social media has really accelerated my learning as a as a surgeon and i've enjoyed that and i'll continue to do that uh, as to whether or not there's going to be anything big probably not i'll be happy to just be at home you know <laughs> following the twitter timelines and following you and enjoying what you say as well <laughs> well, well thank you very much Thanks for listening to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. I want to thank Dr. Eric Levi for being my guest today and discussing the important and timely topic of physician burnout. Um, There have been a number of physician suicides, as Eric uh, mentioned in the interview, that led him to write these articles. And I want to encourage those of you who are listening to speak with your colleagues and maintain the social relationships that help us deal with the enormous stresses that we face in our professions. I think Eric makes a point or made a point in our discussion about the demise of the informal support groups that used to be more common, such as happy hours or going out for coffee with residents. Um, and I, uh, I think that uh, those types of things are, are uh, as valuable, if not more so now, as our work gets even more micromanaged from external factors. I think commiserating with colleagues is probably an underrated way of uh, dealing with these stressors. Um, I know that uh, many physicians and administrators don't have the best uh, relationships, but remember at the end of the day, we both work for the patient. So if we remember that, it'll, it'll be better for all of us. Uh, you can read Eric's articles at ericlevi.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Eric Levi. Uh, I link to both of those on the show notes. And uh, I want to thank you again for listening to this podcast. Uh, more episodes are coming soon. And whether you follow me or not uh, on social media, and I, I, I hope you do on Twitter at DR Money Matters, um, I encourage more physicians to, to use social media to interact with a wider um, array of colleagues around the world. That's how uh, Dr. Levi's uh, article became such a big hit. And I I do think that in this day and age, learning to use social media to uh, expand our um, uh, networking with other physicians is, is valuable and in the long run will benefit the profession as a whole.